I'd like, first of all, to thank very much uh, uh, Professor Tung Wang for inviting me here. This is my second time, actually, at Gordon College. I was here also for one of your undergraduate seminars, and I had the pleasure to meet some of your students and talk with them. And today, I'm happy to see that uh, some students also came, and I uh, hope you guys have uh, questions by the end. I'd like to uh, thank uh, the East-West Institute and, of course, Gordon College and all the people that have been involved in the organization of this uh, meeting of the faculty forum. <clears throat> so my talk today is entitled Shooting for the Stars, Science and Religion in the Early Modern Jesuit Mission to China. And today I'm here to talk about uh, an experiment in cultural and uh, uh, religious transmission that probably has no equals uh, in history, the Jesuit mission at the Chinese court. This was a carefully planned enterprise of great sophistication, but also in many ways a, a flawed effort, hampered by distance, ideological and theological differences, and the workings of politics, both in Europe and in China. After three centuries, we still marvel uh, at the enterprise of this international group of Renaissance men, working as technicians, artists, and scientists for the Chinese imperial court in the pre-modern age, who tried hard to understand that country and spent most of their lives there. They learned from the Chinese and taught them what they knew of uh, European sciences and arts and what they intimately believed about the ultimate meaning of life and of the universe. We should not overlook that this was the central aim for them, to bring their religion, Christianity, to China. In the process, the Jesuits brought many other Western things to China and the imperial court. European notions of astronomy, geography, mathematics, and uh, geometry, perspective and naturalistic painting, Rococo architecture and French gardening, clocks and red wine, and so on. But it was not all so wonderful after all. This letter was written in the 18th century by the French Jesuit Jean Denis uh, Attiré, who worked as a court painter of the Qianlong Emperor of China. And let's listen to what he has to say about his experience in Beijing. And here I quote him. I wanted to do the French accent, but I have already the Italian one, so I won't. <laughs> I stay in the inner court of the Imperial Palace and I'm engaged in painting. My work is extremely hard and taxing. The studio is a small one-story building of a few rooms, exposed to cold and heat. In winter, with only a small fire provided, I barely can handle my brush. In the summer heat, my cramped room becomes a veritable furnace. Besides, the Chinese people generally regard the foreigner as someone from their tributary states. And even if a foreigner applies himself on behalf of the Chinese government, they think that he is only doing his duties. And if he's admitted into the court, they think he's enjoying an extraordinary privilege. However, even if the Chinese all think this is a special favor, I'm entirely indifferent to it. My purpose for coming to China was not for painting. And the reason why I'm not willing to go home to Europe now is not because I cannot give up my painting. I'm only obeying the will of God for the sake of his gospel. Although I'm serving all day long in the inner court, I'm simply imprisoned there. When the Sunday or a feast comes around, I can find no time for prayer. I'm given no opportunity to practice the Holy Liturgy. Besides, even while I'm engaged in painting, I'm so much interfered with by the emperor and his courtiers 
that I could not do my best as I wish. Unless my service to the emperor secured an eternal reward for me in heaven, I should certainly go away without remorse. So one maybe feels a little bit of pity for the poor man. But next to pity, you might have felt also an urgent question. Why on earth are you getting in there? Well, in the case of the Jesuits, the story is long and complex. But Attiré, in his uh, letter, has shown us what to him was the central aim, to bring his religion to China. As I said, the Jesuits also brought many other Western things to China in the scientific, technological, and artistic fields. And let's now see how this all happened. So first of all, who are the Jesuits? Many of you might know that Jesuits today run a number of universities and colleges. Georgetown or Boston College, for example. In fact, education has always been an important part of the job of the Jesuits. They were established as a religious order uh, of the Catholic Church in the mid-16th century. And besides education, one of their main aims was to conduct missionary work in the newly discovered lands of America and in Africa and Asia. And here I want to show you a map of the world at the time with the main missionary and trade routes between Europe and China. We see two routes. One is the Portuguese route. The Portuguese uh, expanded into Asia first, leaving from Lisbon, circumnavigating Africa, going to Goa, and then reaching Macau and eventually Japan. That's the Portuguese route that most Jesuits who went to China used. And then we have the Spanish route from uh, Seville and Cadiz, which was the port uh, in uh, southern Spain, to Mexico and the port of Acapulco on the Pacific side of Mexico, and all the way through the Pacific to Manila, their um, farthest colony in Asia, in the Philippines. So following these routes, the Jesuit arrived to China and settled in the town of Macau. And here we see an uh, um, early 18th century uh, image of uh, the city of Macau, very, very tiny place. I'm going actually there uh, in a little while, uh, at the beginning of December. And here you can notice the border with China. So, this gives you a sense of uh, how tiny the place is and how dependent on uh, Chinese uh, um, support for its survival. The Jesuits were able to place themselves quite high in Chinese society. This was a straight strategy that they used also in Europe. Besides working among the poor, they would also make themselves accepted in scholarly circles and among the powerful princes of the time in Europe. They believed that to influence the higher classes was very important in bringing a revival of the Catholic faith, since the Catholic Church at the time was uh, burdened by corruption and moral decay and was under the attack of the reformed churches. Also in China, the Jesuits were able to reach the imperial capital and be enlisted in the service of the imperial court. If I were to use a metaphor to characterize the Jesuit experience at the service of the, in, of the Chinese imperial court, I would probably use the expression shooting for the stars that you find in our title tonight. And I find that this phrase expresses almost in a poignant way two components of the Jesuit enterprise in China that is, Christian religion on the one hand, and European sciences and arts on the other. On the one hand, the Jesuits went all the way to China to convert to Christianity the Chinese and the Chinese emperor. And that's shooting for the sun itself. But they also literally were shooting their gazes towards 
the starry sky over Beijing, as we can see in this uh, tapestry from uh, the 18th century, representing uh, an encounter between a German Jesuit, Adam Schall, and uh, the, one of the first uh, emperors of the Manchu Qing dynasty, the Shunzhi Emperor. At the end of the Ming period, in the early 17th century, the Jesuits were charged with the, the reform of the imperial calendar that needed urgent correction, uh, corrections. The Society of Jesus, uh, of Jesus, as the order is officially called, selected some of its most talented men and shipped them out to China. Educated in the best schools of Europe, these priests were successful students of some of the most prominent natural philosophers and astrologers, as scientists were called back then. Many of these European scientists were indeed Jesuits. One of the most illustrious uh, among them was the 16th century Jesuit astronomer Christopher Clavius, the man who reformed the old Julian calendar and gave us the Gregorian calendar, which we still use today. He was the teacher of Matteo Ricci, the first missionary who went to China in the late Ming period. And Ricci, with the help of some prominent Chinese converts, first introduced Western astronomy to the imperial court. After the fall of the Ming in 1644, the new Manchu dynasty continued to need the services of the missionaries. And the new conquerors knew too well that a precise calendar was necessary to legitimate their rule. From time immemorial in China, the welfare of the empire has been connected to the movements of the stars. So the Jesuits became officially incorporated in the Chinese bureaucracy and remained the controllers of the Imperial Astronomical Bureau until the end of the 18th century. They built new astronomical instruments and those uh, enormous bronze machines still stand today on the terrace of the ancient uh, observatory of Beijing. And here we see uh, an old print, and here photographs of the observatory as it stands today. It, it doesn't change that much, except that now it's surrounded by the skyscrapers of the financial district, and unfortunately, it is very rarely blessed with a clear starry sky these days. You can see, in fact, the pollution of Beijing here. And these instruments bear witness to this shooting for the stars of the Jesuit astronomers. The poignant part of the story is that this great investment in manpower, financial funds, and intellectual resources that the Jesuits and their political patrons, the kings and princes of Europe and the popes, spent over two centuries to advance their Chinese mission turned out to be a shot too long even for these brilliant priests. Scholars have debated many times on the significance of this uh, religious and cultural mission. Some have uh, praised its successes, others have regretted its failures. Still others have decried its entanglement with Christianity, or with Western powers, or the fact that Jesuit science was extremely conservative and refused to introduce some important discoveries of Galileo and other European scientists to China for a long time. Well, in the time that has been given to me in this talk, I will limit myself to outline the answers to two main questions. First, why on earth did the Jesuits get in there? Which was the question I asked before. And second, why on earth did the Chinese let them in? The Jesuits arrived in China in the 1580s, at a special time in Chinese history, the latter part of the Ming Dynasty, and here we see a map of the Ming Empire. The late Ming was a period of great economic prosperity and unprecedented intellectual diversity and openness, but also a period of strong social polarization, of government disarray, 
of bitter struggles between political factions and of devastating ecological disasters. When the Jesuits arrived, Chinese literati, the Chinese intelligentsia, were in search of a way to understand the world that was crumbly around them and reform the empire. And among the many options available for moral and political reform, a selected number of learned men in government circles found attractive the ideas offered by this new so-called celestial teachings brought by the Jesuits. And what attracted literati to the celestial teachings of the Jesuits was the organic nature of these teachings. Nothing to do with cereals, of course. Let me explain what I mean by organic. In medieval and early modern times, knowledge was organized differently than today. In our present times, we perceive history, theology, philosophy, physics, chemistry, and so on as separate disciplines. And we have separate departments. Moreover, the humanities are rarely seen in conversation with the so-called exact sciences. Maybe some of you will correct me, say, we at Gordon College do it, but in general, it doesn't happen so much. So here we see the model of uh, modern knowledge, columns separated. Theology very often doesn't have much to do with mathematics these days. However, this was not the case in the past. Before the Enlightenment, in uh, Europe, knowledge was constructed in a single hierarchy of disciplines. While some disciplines were more important than others, they all were seen as part of a unitary body of knowledge. And here is the shape of the pyramid that I'm showing you. In the hierarchy of the early modern period, theology was at the top followed by philosophy, and then by what we call hard or exact sciences, and they broadly called natural philosophy. So metaphysics here st stands for the uh, highest form of philosophy. So that's what I mean by organic. All branches uh, uh, of knowledge were interrelated, and the exact sciences measuring and describing the physical world pointed to the superior order of the metaphysical reality described by philosophers and theologians. In China, things were similar in many respects. In spite of differences in the classification of knowledge, also in China, metaphysics, what goes beyond the physical world, was placed very high on the hierarchy. All other forms of knowledge, including exact sciences, were there to reveal and explain the hidden ideal pattern of the universe. Confucian scholars certainly did not believe in a personal God like the Christian God. But they were also extremely interested in understanding the ultimate meaning of the world and the place of humans in the scheme of things. And like the Jesuit, also their project was one of organic knowledge. And it is precisely this common belief in the organic nature of knowledge, both in the West and China, that accounts for this initial interest towards the religious and the scientific aspects of the Jesuit mission to China. Right here, we don't need this. Uh, this is just a comparison of the two models. The Jesuit, as most people of their time, Galileo and Newton included, believed that there was a unified hierarchy of knowledge. They thought that knowledge of metaphysical realities had to be premised on the knowledge of physical reality. And here I want to give you really a physical, uh, um, 
figurative way of seeing this pyramid in the, this uh, frontispiece of a book that was published in 1677 uh, by a very famous uh, Jesuit uh, polymath uh, scientist, Athanasius Kircher. And the book is entitled uh, China Illustrata, uh, uh, Illustrated China. And it was based on uh, his correspondence with uh, the Chinese uh, missionaries, uh, what he thought about the Chinese language, Chinese culture, and so on and so forth. And the frontispiece, uh, the opening uh, image of the book, uh, shows, uh, on the one hand, uh, Matteo Ricci, the Italian founder of the Jesuit mission in China in Ming uh, attire, Adam Charles von Bell, this German Jesuit who became later on head of the Astronomical Bureau in uh, official garb of the Manchu Qing dynasty. And what we see here are scientific instruments pertaining to geometry and astronomy. And notice the position. They are down here on this corner. But what is the focus of everything, well, besides having at the center a map of China, is in fact on top. This is the monogram of the Society of Jesus, the name of Christ. It's a representation, of course, of God. And uh, uh, the monogram is uh, surrounded by the two saints, uh, Ignatius of Loyola and Francis Xavier, two major saints of the uh, early days of the society. And you can see that there are, uh, I don't know if you can see it from this image, but there is light coming out on the two missionaries. So again, here you really have a sense of this triangular or py pyramidal kind of shape of knowledge, which is here represented in uh, um, the engraving. So the Jesuit in China brought a body of knowledge consisting not only of natural and physical sciences, showing the workings of the physical world, but also a moral system centered on a supreme ordering principle of the universe, the Christian Lord of Heaven, that's the name in Chinese, Tianzhu. And Ming scholars, Ming dynasty scholars, in their almost obsessive search for a way to reform their decaying society through what they call practical learning, including the sciences, found this moral, religious, and scientific system quite attractive. But here was also the difficulty in China. The very human God of the Christians is not a philosophical principle, except in some rarefied theological models. The Christian God is a fatherly figure who begot a son through a mortal woman. And here theologians maybe will correct my incorrect theological expressions. This was too much to accept for many Chinese scholars in search of principles of universal order. They had been trained through the subtleties of uh, Buddhist thought and of new Confucian cosmology to think of the supreme principle as a cosmic force, difficult to define and uh, present in all things, immanent in things, but certainly not having human forms. So how could they accept the embodied divinity of Christianity. And uh, as a matter of fact, a small number of Chinese intellectuals did in fact accept the idea. Here we have a portrait of Matteo Ricci and the major convert of the Ming dynasty, Xu Guanqi, who became grand secretary of uh, the Ming empire. These Chinese converts could do so by creatively defining the Christian God in Chinese ways, emphasizing his fatherly role and the idea of a God King, of a Lord of Heaven, of an Emperor on High. These were all titles used by the, the Chinese for the Christian God. However, by the 1630s, in the final years of the Ming Dynasty, important scholars stopped converting to the foreign creed disenchanted with their failed schemes for political and moral reform of the empire, they lived in a country threatened by peasant rebellions and barbarian attacks at the borders, and became less and less interested in experimenting with what they increasingly perceived as an alien import. 
Instead, the community of Christian converts mainly comprised commoners from then on. And then came the conquest of the Ming Empire by the Manchus in 1644. The conquest was followed by internal strife between southern Chinese regimes loyal to the fallen Ming Dynasty and the armies of the newly established Qing Dynasty. And here we have a map of the Qing Empire at its peak in the 18th century. Uh, it's much bigger than the Ming Empire and it includes uh, Tibet, big parts of Central Asia, Northeastern China, and uh, here you see the borders of today's China. So you see it's even bigger than today's China. The Jesuits uh, who were scattered in different parts of the empire sided with different parties, with the Southern Ming and with the Northern uh, Manchu dynasty. In Beijing, the German Jesuit astronomer Adam Schall, and here we see him, chose to side with the Manchus and was uh, awarded honors and the power to reform the Chinese calendar. Here again we see Ricci, the first uh, Ming dynasty missionary, Schall at the beginning of the Manchu dynasty, and this is his successor, Ferdinand Ferbist, a Flemish Jesuit who uh, became later on the head uh, of the Astronomical Bureau. Here instead we see again uh, Xu Guanqi, the Grand Secretary, and his grand niece, Candida Xu, who uh, during the early Qing period, the early Manchu period, uh, was a great uh, patron of the Chinese community of Christians. So with the victory of the Manchus, the Jesuits succeeded in getting into the bureaucratic machinery of the new Qing dynasty. You can see that they are dressed up as uh, Qing uh, officials. And they tried to continue their plan to spread their celestial studies in China, this time from the strong position of advisors to the imperial government. However, Chinese intellectual elites, while interested in the physical sciences of the Jesuits, started rejecting their metaphysical, overarching frame. In short, the Chinese acknowledged the usefulness of Western sciences, but wanted to use them to understand the hidden principles of the universe on their own terms. And the Jesuits ended up being trapped in the Qing court, as Atire said at the beginning attempting still to use that special place to further what I have called their organic project, but less and less effectively. Many scholars and officials, in fact, began to oppose the celestial teachings of the Jesuits. The first uh, large offensive happened in the 1660s. Chinese and Muslim astronomers attacked the work of the Jesuits on the imperial calendar precisely criticizing the Christian cosmology and the religious components of the Jesuits' teachings. That crisis was eventually overcome, but somehow it foreshadowed the nature of the Jesuits' relationship with the Manchu emperors. Only the personal favor of the throne could protect the Jesuits from the attacks of Chinese officials and scholars. But while patronage brought favor, one could also fall from favor very easily. The Jesuit, I must say, got lucky. The emperor who got them out of trouble during this calendar controversy in the 1660s was the Kangxi emperor, who was a voraciously curious man, a very shrewd ruler, and a surprisingly open-minded monarch. And here we have a, a traditional court portrait of uh, the Kangxi Emperor in uh, court robes, and uh, a portrait that was published in Europe uh, by the Jesuits of their protector in a biography that they wrote about uh, him, comparing him favorably to the king's son, Louis XIV of France, who was reigning at the same time. Kangxi, Conscious of his role as the builder of a still weak empire 
and of the multi-ethnic nature of that empire, including Manchus, Han Chinese, Mongols, and other Central Asian peoples, was able with great success to negotiate the different cultural and religious traditions of his vast domain. Even Westerners and their religion there were welcome. The Jesuits, and in particular the most prominent of the court scientists, the Flemish Ferdinand Verbist I showed you before, even hoped in the 1670s to succeed in introducing their organic project within the curriculum of the famous civil examination system, which was the gate to success for any ambitious individual in Imperial China through the publication of a collection of translated scientific and philosophical texts from Europe. So this is kind of a very ambitious uh, plan of planting a Trojan horse within the uh, examination system of China that selected civil servants. And this is the, the title of this manuscript collection, which was never published, Chung Li Xue, The Learning of the Fathoming of Principle. These are words that uh, echo Neo-Confucian vocabulary, but in a letter to his superiors in uh, Europe, this is what Ferbist wrote. This is a Chinese version of our Western dialectics and philosophy, more specifically under the cover of giving a deeper insight into our astronomy, but in reality, to give a better foundation to our Christian teaching. So here it's very clearly, once again, this idea of uh, the sciences as uh, the preliminary step to conversion to Christianity. In the end, the plan failed as the advisors of the emperors, the members of the famous Hanling Academy, rejected the suggestion of the missionary. So this text was never included in the examination curriculum with other Neo-Confucian texts. And so the Jesuits had to earn their patron's favor the hard way, working for him day and night. And at this point, let's pause for a moment and try to imagine how the daily life of these Jesuits was back then. We can take the final years of the Kangxi reign in the early 18th century as uh, our point in time. At that time, a group of French Jesuits trained in a number of sciences had built with imperial money a beautiful church in the imperial city that is just outside of the imperial palace. And here we see a picture of this church. Sent by the king of France over 20 years earlier, the French Jesuits had become very close to the emperor, teaching him mathematics and doing cartographic surveys and all kinds of artistic and technical jobs for him. And their daily life tells us about the tension of religion and science in their work. We have seen that the working condition of one of the Jesuits later in the 18th century where uh, the, uh, um, at the beginning of my talk we have seen those. Uh, some of the fathers in Beijing were busy running around the city to take care of their congregations doing missionary work, but on top of their religious work they had to be always ready to run to the palace at the emperor's command. But we should not be surprised that the Jesuits were so busy. In fact, the emperors Kangxi and his uh, successors, Yunzheng and Qianlong, were truly workaholics and also expected from their subjects the same degree of diligence. Kangxi, for example, woke up before dawn around 4 a.m., attended some lectures on the Confucian classics, I guess after breakfast, then spent the rest of the morning starting at times as early as 5 a.m. in audiences with his officials, discussing with them administrative decisions of the central government. Finally, he would close the morning with members of the imperial household to discuss matters of uh, palace administration. And after lunch in the afternoon, the emperor would do his own studies, writing poems, practicing calligraphy until the sunset. And he probably, I hope for him, he took a nap. But when the candles were lit 
at 8 p.m. after dinner, he would read the secret memorials that were pouring in from the provincial officials and write uh, himself in red ink comments on the memorials in response. And he would often work until midnight. And this schedule, of course, made uh, life difficult for officials as well, who had to wake up very early in the middle of winter, get on their horses and go to the palace uh, for the audiences. Fortunately for them, the Jesuits did not have to go to audiences that often, but they had to report to their offices uh, on a daily basis. And in certain periods, they indeed had to meet with the emperor himself every day. For example, in the 1690s, two of the French fathers would go to the palace every day, two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening, to teach the eager emperor Western mathematics and geometry. Cancy would usually have them step on his platform. That was where the Manchu emperors sat. Imagine something like this, cross-legged. And have them sit near to him to show him the geometrical figures and explain things to him more easily. And even during the summer vacations, so the students uh, here probably say, oh no, even during the summer vacations, at the palace of Eternal Spring, a few miles from Beijing, he would not interrupt his lessons. The fathers, the Jesuit fathers, were then obliged to go to the summer palace every day, no matter what time it was. They would leave Beijing at 4 a.m. and would return to their residence in the city only at the beginning of the night. Maybe some of your professors were commuting from far away to wake up at 4 too. I don't know. And then as soon as they were back home after the lessons, they would have to start working again, often spending part of the night in composing and preparing the lesson for the following day. And this continuous traveling and those sleepless nights really tired them. And sometimes they felt really overwhelmed, as we can read in their letters. And according to Jesuit reports, the emperor continued for four or five years this kind of studies with the same schedule, without diminishing his efforts in running state affairs at the same time, and without missing for one day his audiences. So we have figured out why the Jesuit endured all of this for Christianity, right? But I asked also another question, the second one. Why did the Chinese, and in particular the Qing emperors, let the Jesuits into China? And we have seen that Kangxi rescued the Jesuits from their controversy with Chinese astronomers in the 1660s. Then he employed them in many state-building projects, like the mapping of the empire. For example, the first scientific mapping of the Chinese empire was done under Jesuit direction. And last but not least, he had them as his personal teacher, uh, teachers of Western sciences. So the Qing state was getting needed know-how from them. But that is not all. In 1691, for example, the emperor got malaria fever. And no remedy was found that could cure him. Finally, a Jesuit offered him some quinin, a new drug imported by Westerners from Macau. And the imperial fever disappeared. And the gratitude of the emperor for his foreign servants increased. The French Jesuit mission got a large piece of land and they could build that church that I showed you. So from this particular example, we see that many factors were at play in Cancy's letting the door open. State building was one. The introduction of Western knowledge for the reform of the calendar was another. Court politics, yet another one. But what seems to have mattered quite a bit was the personal relationship. A relationship that was almost like that of a father to his sons. And this was, in fact, the metaphor that emperors used all the time while referring to their subjects. Things changed, though, after the death of their protector. When the son of Kanxi, the Yunzheng emperor, ascended the throne, think, uh, the personal relationship was completely gone. Here we see 
the uh, Yunjiang Emperor as a Taoist master taming a dragon. And here we see him in a curious portrait uh, in Western attire, a sort of uh, play for the court ladies. First problem, the new emperor was a devout Buddhist. Here we see him as a portrayed as a Buddhist lama. And this certainly did not buy well for the Christian priests. More important, though, is the fact that he had fought with his brothers for the throne in the waning years of his father's reign. And one of the Portuguese Jesuits happened to choose the wrong side, participating in the struggle. Even worse, a whole branch of the imperial clan that was opposed to the Yunjiang Emperor converted to Catholicism. So soon after ascending the throne, Yunjiang forbade the preaching of Christianity and had his relatives in the Catholic camp arrested. The Portuguese Jesuit was ordered to commit suicide, which was an honorable way to go. But since he could not kill himself being a priest and a, and a Christian, he had finally to be strangled by one of the guards. Most of the converts in the imperial clan ended up in prison and spent all their life there. So the intersection of religion and scientific knowledge of the Jesuit mission could not be tolerated openly anymore. Yun Zheng, in fact, clearly understood the nature of the Jesuit work in China. In a meeting he had with some of the court Jesuits in 1724, he observed quite bluntly, and here I quote, during the reign of my father, you built churches in all provinces and you have rapidly expanded. I saw it, but I did not dare to say anything. But if you have been able to cheat my father, do not hope to do the same with me. You want all the Chinese to become Christians. I know well that this is something required by your religion. But if that happens, what will we become? The subjects of your king? Your Christians only recognize you. And in time of trouble, they will listen only to your voice. I know well that there is nothing to fear now. But when the boats will come more numerous from your countries, then there could be disorders. Well, in the light of the history of China in the 19th century, when Western boats arrived numerous, and with them there were many gunships, these words sound something prophetic. Yet the Jesuits decided to keep the Jesuits at court. Clearly, their contribution to the construction of the Qing state, the glory of the imperial house, and the private pleasures of the emperor and his court were still deemed too important to be discarded. And this attitude persisted under Yun Zheng and his son Qianlong. And here we have a portrait of the young Qianlong emperor done by a Jesuit, Giuseppe Castiglione. Christianity was forbidden but the Jesuits were allowed to continue their work in the capital. In fact, especially Qianlong continued to eagerly seek their services. But at this point, uh, and what kind of services? For example, the Jesuits built for the emperor a uh, um, Western-style summer palace. Here it is in Rococo style. Now it doesn't exist any longer. It has been destroyed by the Anglo-French troops uh, in uh, the attack to Beijing in uh, 1860. And he painted for him. For example, Castiglione painted this famous equestrian portrait of the Qianlong Emperor. But we find no more trace of the organic project fusing religion and science of the earlier years. No doubt this was both due to changes in China and in Europe. The 18th century missionaries, especially those coming from France, had been educated in a different world, a world that had started separating disciplines more starkly. European academicians eagerly awaited the installment published in Paris of the famous collection from the Jesuit missions entitled Edifying and Curious Letters. But most of these scholars were little interested in the edifying aspect of the letters. They wanted to know about the technicalities of porcelain making in China or the geography of Asia. And the missionaries themselves had stopped believing in the possibility to further their organic project in China. By the final years of the Kangxi reign, 
Chinese literati and the court had become almost impossible targets for that fusion of religious and scientific elements of the organic project. On top of that, Chinese also started arguing that Western principles were just a derivation of the ancient ideas contained in the Chinese classics, a theory that they called the Chinese origins of Western learning. You are not teaching anything new. We all knew it of before. Castiglione continued to work for his emperor, and from time to time, he also interceded in favor of missionaries who continued to live incognito, underground, in the provinces. In a way, he was using his position at court near the emperor to protect Christianity in the provinces. But we could ask, who was who's in whom? As it has been put nicely by a contemporary Jesuit scholar of the China mission, uh, Nicola Standard, the philosophy of the founder of the Jesuits, Ignatius of Loyola, had been turned on his head by the Chinese. This is what uh, Standard writes. And here I quote, Jesuit accommodation is often described by a sentence attributed to Ignatius of Loyola. Enter through the door of the other, so as to make them leave through our door. But the Chinese said to the Jesuits, you should enter through our door. Moreover, you should remain inside, and you cannot leave without permission. Anyway, we have no intention to live through your door. And here I close the, the quotation. So this might sound as a defeat of uh, the Jesuit utopian project. And I'm not here to discuss its merits. That, I think, is not the work of the historian. I would like only to point to the extraordinary human dimension of this most fascinating story. The Jesuits sat at the side of Kanxi teaching him mathematics or astronomy, and at the same time learning Chinese, Manchu, the Chinese classics, to serve the emperor and Christianity better. Kansi understood their mission, often disagreed, but always recognized the dedication of these men who promised to never leave China once they enter its borders. The story was a different one with Yun Zheng and Qianlong. But even if Qianlong was a very demanding boss, the emperor never failed to praise the abilities of his Western artists and technicians. For example, when he was himself aged, the emperor more than once in his poetry expressed his wonder at being able, as an old man, to enter a room and be confronted by his own youthful self always noting that he hardly knew at whom he was looking. And it is not surprising that he ordered lavish celebrations for the 70th birthday of Castiglione, his court painter. As to the Jesuit themselves, in spite of their complaints, as we heard at the beginning of the talk, it seems that they still had pride in their work. In writing in, to Europe, they still seemed secretly pleased to let people know that they had been in all the rooms of the palace to paint or to repair a Western clock. Here we see one of the concubines of the Yun Zheng Emperor in her apartment and a Western clock inside the apartment. Or some of the extravagant clocks that the Qianlong Emperor ordered in Europe to be made by uh, European clock uh, makers and shipped all the way to China. The Jesuit continued until the end of their mission to write long scientific reports to Europe, singing the praises of Chinese porcelain, describing with marvel the long history of China, speculating on the nature of its language. They kept shooting for the stars until the end. And that, I think, is the stuff that often keeps us going. A sense of wonder for the world we inhabit and a consuming passion to uncover the meaning of the world. Thank you very much.